Now, six weeks ago, my first guest resigned from The Guardian, a newspaper she has loved and worked for for 22 years, most of her working life. The reason? She claims she was censored about writing on the Labour Party during the Jeremy Corbyn era, uh, from her perspective in part as a Jew, and then again about writing about gender and trans issues from her perspective as a woman. Both claims The Guardian paper denies. Her resignation has sparked considerable debate in the media world uh, after extracts of her resignation letter to the newspaper's editor, Catherine Viner, whom we've also invited onto the programme, were leaked and have appeared in private eye. Hadley Freeman is who I'm talking about. She's worked uh, as a staff writer, as I say, for a long time, 22 years at The Guardian, but joins The Sunday Times in January and is also an author. She's finishing a book at the moment on girls and anorexia, which comes out next year. Hadley Freeman's just joined me in the studio. Good morning. Hi, Emma. Why did you resign when you did? Um, well, uh, as you say, I'd been at The Guardian for a long time and it felt like I'd been in a very happy long-term marriage uh, for 15 years. And then about seven years ago, that particular partner started to become a conspiracy theorist, to be honest, and sort of unrecognisable to me. And it just got to a point where I couldn't take any more. And the specific conspiracy I'm referring to is, of course, the um, gender identity or you know, gender theory idea and the censorship of women writing on it. And the thing that finally pushed me over the edge was I'd been asking editors across the paper for uh, over six years if I could write or someone could write a long piece about mermaids and Susie Green, the charity that uh, claims to support what it calls gender non-conforming children. And I was always, always told no, but the reasons always changed. It was, you know, this isn't the right time or we don't see the interest, et cetera, et cetera. Even when Mermaids was given 500 grand by um, the National Lottery, I was still told, no, there's there's no news peg. And then I pitched again in August to an editor and they said, no, it's not relevant or something. And then in September, the Daily Telegraph ran a big expose about mermaids and it led to the Charity Commission saying they were going to look into it. And I asked the news desk, you know, are you going to follow up on this? And they told me, no, we don't follow other people's stories. And I just thought, um, so you don't, you're not going to commission me to do anything or anyone, not necessarily me, a news reporter. It didn't have to be me. And you also won't follow other people's reporting on it. Like, I don't understand. And at that point, I thought, OK, it's time to go. I mean, I should say on Friday evening on that point about mermaids, the Charity Commission has escalated its investigations into mermaids, um, announcing it's responding to newly identified issues about the governments and management of the transgender children's charity. Hadley, to come to your, your points there, there's, there's a few in there. You are saying that you specifically were not allowed uh, to, to write about this. Are you saying others were and you weren't? No, um, I was specifically not allowed. I was specifically told by upper management um, that I wasn't allowed to write about gender stuff in about 2018, 2019, I think. Um, and others weren't either. I know of multiple reporters who asked if they could interview, for example, Maya Forstadter during her case, Alison Bailey, um, Jester Walls. I asked about interviewing J.K. Rowling uh, and Martina Navarro. Ratilova, and we were all told no. Meanwhile, you know, the, the paper ran these long glowing profiles of trans activists such as Monroe Bergdorf and Paris Lees and Fred McConnell. And I'm proud to have worked at a paper that spotlit marginalized people like that. I just don't understand. Well, I do understand, but it infuriated me that feminist campaigners such as Julie Bindle, who I also pitched to interview when her book came out, and J.K. Rowling were basically shut out from the paper. When you go on The Guardian's website, there are uh, interviews with uh, those who are described as having so-called, some people don't even agree with this way of describing it, but if we could just use this phrase for a moment, gender-critical views, such as Kathleen Stock, who I remember interviewing here on, on the programme, uh, after she was, was put in a position, as she said, that she felt she had to leave Sussex mm. University, and Maya Forstatter, who you talked about, who won that uh, particular case. They're on The Guardian website, but are they under The Observer? Uh, I believe Maya Forstadter like. was interviewed in The Observer. I'm sure someone can correct me if that's wrong. Kathleen Stock was interviewed in The Guardian, which was amazing. And we were all, you know, those of us who'd been trying to get interviews with these women, you know, cheered about it. But as far as I know, her book was not reviewed by The Guardian and nor was um, Abigail Schreier's, who wrote about the effect of trans activism on, on girls, and nor was Helen Joyce's very, you know, huge bestseller about uh, trans or gender ideology. But we did review 
and extract, it seems to me, every single trans memoir that came out. So there was always this imbalance. And I know that upper management, you know, say, well, both sides are equally passionate. You know, it's very hard to balance both the gender activists and you know, what people call gender critical feminists, I call reality based feminists. But the fact is, only one side in that argument demands censorship. I have no problem and never had any problem with Guardian interviewing and spotlighting, uh, you know, trans activists, trans activist books. But I was not allowed and nor was anyone else to in allowed to interview gender critical feminists or, you know, feature are, gender are, critical. There are some, I There's suppose one. that's the point. Kathleen is Kathleen. And, and I did read an interview with Maya, but I think- In The Observer. In, in The Observer. And we should say, just again, if you're not familiar with the, the media world, The Observer is edited by a different editor. Yeah, yeah that's it right. is. It's edited by a different editor. Okay. So, because your part of your resignation letter I mentioned was leaked to Private Eye, which was yeah. to Kath Viner, mm -hmm. who we have in, invited on. We didn't get Kath Reiner, the invitation is still open, but we did get this statement from The Guardian which said, The Guardian has always been committed to representing a wide range of views on many topics in our coverage. There will always be debate on the issues we cover. The issues around trans people's rights and gender critical feminism are complex and can be polarising and polarised. As such, The Guardian aims to feature a wide range of reporting and multiple perspectives on this topic. All writers work with their editors to decide the topics on which they write, this is a completely standard practice across the media. That is not censorship. It is editing. <laughs> I I understand what they're saying, and I'm you know I'm not a, an idiot. You know I've been I was there for 22 years. I had a column for most of those 22 years. Of course, you're not allowed. You know you you discuss with your editor what you're writing beforehand. But on no other subject had I ever been told you are not allowed to write about this wholesale. Who who said that? Um, it was it was someone quite high up in the paper. So it actually said to you... Yes, yeah, said, you are not allowed to write about gender. And also they said to me at the same time, I don't want any women to be writing about gender because it gets too much of a kickback on social media. It should be done by the male specialist reporters, such as the health reporters. So that was said to you by an individual? It was said to me in a meeting with three other people who can all back me up on that. And, and I'm asking because I also was interested if it had been said to you by the editor herself as I mean, well. I don't want to be naming and pointing direct fingers. It was said by upper management. It was clear that was the policy. Because there are a couple of pieces, which I know we're also going to come to mm -hmm. because of what then happened with those pieces, mm -hmm. uh, where you have written and shared your views. Yep. Well, you saying there was a policy change because they're, they're about four years old, yep. those pieces. Yeah, so that was a policy change. So I wrote, I think, two columns in my week, my magazine column, mm. um, which I had at the time. Uh, one was about uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, about the interview she gave, and one was about uh, sort of progressive men using gender activism as a sort of guise to be incredibly misogynistic and to shout at women, not mainly online, but also in life. And I wrote those, and there was a huge backlash online and I, also within the office. And then I went and went, I went to America for work and was there for a bit, I think, covering the Oscars or something, and came back. You, you did have quite a broad range, we used to say, of people who were fashion through to politics. Yeah, I mean, I like to write about most things, really. Um, I'm not I'm not myopic in that sense. And um, came back, and that's when I was told that I wasn't to write about gender, and actually women shouldn't write about gender, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly things became very, very tricky for me. And, you know, I asked if I could interview Martina Navratilova after she wrote a column in the Sunday Times about why she didn't think trans women should be, compete against female athletes. And I was told that my point of view and Navratilova's point of view were mean. Um, you know, I would... You, you were told that your, your point of view was mean? Yeah, that was the quote I was told. Sorry, OK. Yeah, and... Um, you know, other people, Jester Walls and, you know, other women who've had trouble um, with gender activists. And it was always no, no, no. And then I was told a few months after this began that while I was away, a group called All About Trans, which is, I believe, the best way to describe them would be a lobby group who go around to different companies and media groups and talk about how trans people should be discussed or written about, had come to The Guardian and they'd held up two of my articles as uh, examples of transphobia. And this was this had happened when I was told it had happened about eight months previously while I was away. And when I went to HR and some of the editors and asked, you know, could this could they send out some message to my section editors who'd been at this event? And also, I should say all about trans, you know, consisted of people from mermaids and mermaids had been at this event, too, I was told. Um, so when I said, can you can you let my section editors know and my colleagues know that? this isn't fair, that, you know, you don't believe this. And I was told they couldn't because it would draw more attention to the claim. So, so you found out months afterwards that while yeah. you were away, your place of work had had a session on by an external group yeah. 
welcomed by, I believe, the, the Guardian Pride Group, which is a, mm-hmm. a group of staffers within within the place. Uh, and your two articles were held up as transphobic. Yeah. And you weren't told about that in advance? Oh, God, no. And I wasn't told about it immediately afterwards. I just found out when a friend and colleague uh, happened to mention it to me, saying she thought I should know, as it was clear no one had told me, because I kept saying to her, I don't understand what's changed. Um, and there, is, there did suddenly become this atmosphere of real fear in the paper. And there were various morning conferences to which all... Um, people who work at The Guardian are invited to at the beginning of the day. We don't really have those anymore, but pre-pandemic, it would be everybody gathering, talking about the news. And there was one of those conferences where the paper had run an editorial defending uh, the Gender Recognition Act and why it shouldn't be made easier for people to change gender. And I was defending the editorial, which had run in the paper. And various colleagues and people I considered friends were being quite personally abusive and, you know, saying it was transphobic. This is like a teacher saying a gay teacher shouldn't... This is like people saying a gay teacher shouldn't teach children. And I got very upset, and I've never gotten upset in the office before, and I, I just walked out. And meanwhile, you know, the, the top editors were all at the meeting. No one said anything. No one intervened. You know, I, I understand it's a subject that gets very heated, but... In my memory, and as far as I know, and I've looked back on all my correspondence because I saved all my emails, I've tried to be very calm and measured and look at, you know, both sides of it. Of course I do. And what you get from the other side, if you're just trying to defend what is literally the law in this country, is being told you're killing children, you know, you're a bigot, you're this, this very, you know, violent sort of way of talking. And it's not that that upsets me. I can take that. What I don't understand is why upper management are scared to deal with it. And it seems to me that it's not just The Guardian. I don't want to just be focusing on The Guardian, although obviously it's where I worked. This has happened at a lot of progressive places. This feeling of fear that we can't stand up against some of the claims that gender activists made. You know, it's happened at The New York Times. It happened at The Washington Post. You know, even on Women's Hour, I'm not like trying to make anything awkward for you, Emma, but I remember a few years ago when Jenny Murray was still here and she wrote a piece in The Sunday Times that some people got upset about. She then wasn't allowed to talk about this issue, as far as I know, on the program. Um, I remember another time here when... There was, there was going to be a, a, a debate in the studio and Stonewall said they wouldn't come in if the journalist Helen Lewis was here. And in the end, Women's Hour capitulated to them and allowed them to do a pre-record, which is therefore then not a discussion. There well, is a f- you, you make out, A, I don't know about that particular one. That's not while I was here. I've mm. done a lot of interviews with the CEO of Stonewall, Kathleen Stock. We've done many items on this. Nor can I speak to any of the previous decisions before I joined. No, 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 um, of course. I mean, I'm not... The I'm issue not- about... What you discussed about Jenny Murray, though, I think it is fair to say it's quite clear that BBC presenters are not meant to have opinions. So we could debate that, um, but that is your take on it. And I think we we could also just talk about processes as well. But again, I wasn't here for that. Yeah, of course. No, I'm I'm not trying to get at Women's Hour. I'm saying that this is something. I also that would has reject we're a bastion of left leaning journalism Absolutely. at the BBC, like the Guardian Absolutely. Uh, wants to be. Um, but, but your bigger point is that you feel on this that there is. On the left side, what? I think there's a, a gen- well. I think what there is is a real feeling of fear because what Stonewall and other organisations like that have very been have been very successful at is saying that gender rights are the same as gay rights, and anyone who objects to any element of the gender activism is basically a homophobe, and so there's this fear on the left, on particularly in progressive circles, of getting it wrong because that would be the worst thing to be would be to be a bigot. My personal feeling is if you have fear, if you're scared of saying what is literally in front of you, if you're scared of voicing doubts because of what people in the office might say, because of what strangers online might say, then you probably shouldn't be a journalist. You know, a journalist is about... So do you think the editor of The Guardian is scared? And do you think she shouldn't be in her job? Oh, my... I mean, I'm not going to... Well, you're busy saying, uh, you know, various programmes have capitulated without knowing the background. You do know the background of your newspaper. (laughs) Uh, I do know that. And you're not short of opinions. And unlike Jenny Murray, when she was at the BBC, you're allowed to say them, you're paid for them. (laughs) So do you think she should be in her job? It's a very serious allegation to say the editor of the biggest left-leaning newspaper in this country is censoring women from writing about gender. I, Should she be in the job? I didn't say that the editor had censored. I said All right, sorry. She presu- she pres- but, but, sorry, but management is management. And when you say upper management, she's... Presu- I can't, I'll rephrase. She's presiding over management, mm-hmm. which told you with mm-hmm. witnesses mm-hmm. on several occasions and your articles were used within the organisation's uh, hosting of groups that you're, you're not allowed to write about certain things. That's a very serious allegation. 
Yeah, and it's happened at other places too. I mean, it's it's you know. I, Do you I, think she's fit to be the editor? <laughs> I'm sure she's fit to be the editor. What I'm saying is, it's not right for any newspaper to censor on any specific subject. Why is she then fit to be the editor? <laughs> I'm not going to try to push her out for a job, Emma. No, no, but it's a question that will our, some of our listeners will read The Guardian. They want to know they're being shown a full range of views. Some of them may push back. I mean, I was just looking at the Mermaids articles from the last few days. Those articles have been written up as straight news articles on The Guardian yeah. website. After I left. After you left? Yeah. Uh, you have left already, yeah. Yes, You've not started left. yet. Um, but, but I suppose uh, that, that some would also say other parts of the paper, maybe the sports section, do you think that has been better yes. uh, at writing about some of the issues in trans there? It has. Because, OK, fine, because it's interesting to try and compare if there's a difference. You and I both in our newspapers work, again, I'm trying to reveal, mm -hmm. there's a difference with the news desk, the yeah. comment desk, the sports desk, different editors. Yeah, and this is why I'm not trying to target Kath Viner in particular. I mean, there are different section editors all around the paper. And sport has been... Um, good at this. There's a columnist, Sean Ingle, has been very good at, at writing about the science behind this. And But I do know as well that there have been lobby groups that have come in to talk to the sports desks sort of arguing the case for trans athletes, uh, trans women athletes to be competing against female athletes. As far as I know, there hasn't been a group like Fair Play to Women, you know, defending why women's sport needs to be, um, you know, female sex only. Um, you know, and I'm not here. I, I understand why I'm sure people at The Guardian will think I'm just here slamming The Guardian. And to be honest, that breaks my heart because yeah, you I cared about about The Guardian. It. And, you know, it was my whole life for my entire adult life. It's, it's The Guardian is representative of so many other progressive spheres, academia, publishing, exactly the do, same. Do you think something is changing? Well, I think this year is going to be, this coming year is going to be very interesting because obviously GIDS, the clinic run by the Tavistock, um, trust is shutting down and uh, it's no longer will children be funneled there, gender non-conforming whatever that even means, children will not be funneled there, there will be various regional hubs Mermaids is under investigation I think more and more people are looking at what uh, this gender ideology actually means in practice rather than theory, rather than the be kind theory, what does this actually mean for children and for women and for you know gay people, I mean I really do see this idea that gender, non that the idea that gender non-conforming is problematic which is what gender ideology is based on as a backlash against both feminism and gay rights and I think there are increasing numbers of gay people who are speaking up against it too. We will talk again I'm sure about these issues of which there are many and there are different views as you well know and you said you want the other views there yeah, you just fine. want your views as well right. and, and the ability to have it. Of course. I, I, I didn't mention this and I just want to make sure I go back to it the other concern in your resignation letter wasn't just about this mm -hmm. was about your ability or being allowed to write about anti-semitism in the Labour Party. Uh, yeah. with a Jewish background, a Jewish identity. Yeah. What, what, again, I, I presume within this statement we've got from The Guardian that is also refuted, but what, what do you say about that? Well, what happened there was I was given the column at the front of the magazine in, I believe, 2015, and no one said you can't write about any subject. And in fact, when I started at The Guardian and the magazine was edited by Kath Fine, who's now the editor of the paper, that column was done by Julie Birchall, and certainly no one would ever dare tell Julie Birchall she's not allowed to write about a certain subject. And then Corbyn got in and I wanted to look at his his you know this feeling that he had a blind spot as they say when it comes to anti-semitism and i was told that you know that that column was not for politics it wasn't for it wasn't a political space uh, it should be more softer more cheery uppy which no one had told me when i started and i thought oh, okay you know i'm a grown up fine i'll do my job okay carry on so and then the gender ideology started to take off a lot and i thought well this seems a more generalized subject, you know, writing about women, you know, what does being a woman mean? Um, and then I was told, no, I couldn't write about that either. Um, that was too, you know, punchy, it was too something. And then, I mean, we saw what happened. Yeah, I'm sure some of your viewers saw, or listeners saw what happened when Suzanne Moore wrote a column in um, the Guardian feature section, writing about her experience of being a woman through her biology. It then resulted in 330 staff members write, uh, signing a letter objecting to the pattern of transphobic content in the paper, none of which was specified. Um, so it's it's not... It stemmed, you would say, from your experience of being told no about the Jeremy Corbyn side of things through it, into this. It, that was I, the, the I, journey. Yeah, I feel like there was a, a through line. Through yeah, it. I, I mean, of course, Sikis Dahmer's talked a lot about, for instance, accepting the findings of the report, the 
e, uh, EHRC report, which looked into the Labour Party and this, saying it had committed unlawful acts, saying we've closed the door on a shameful chapter in our history about anti-Semitism, for those who also want to respond to that. J j just finally, because you mentioned Chimamanda, fantastic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Gautier, I've had her on the programme, I've spoken to her a number of times, uh, about her um, and her response around this particular topic, uh, around gender, um, she's just given uh, mm. some, one of the wreath lectures here at the BBC and she's talked about self-censorship. She worries the society, yep. just broadening this right out, which I know interests you, is suffering from an epidemic of self-censorship. Young people growing up afraid to ask questions for fear of asking the wrong questions and she's worried about the death of curiosity. Mm. What, what, what would you say to that? Well, I know that's true. You know, when I stood up for Suzanne Moore in a morning conference after this column came out, you know, I had various staff members, not necessarily young people, people my age and older, coming up to me, you know, whispering or sending me an email saying, you know, you know, I back you, I just can't speak up, da, da, da. it's just too difficult in the office or it's too difficult with my teenagers at home. Of course there is. We know this. You know, it's it's very hard to go against what you're told is the mantra for your political tribe. And that is what I think is, is happening. And the fact is, as much as The Guardian or the New York Times or whoever would want to make this argument as gender critical women on the right, gender activists on the left. We know it's not that simple. It's not. That's a lie. You know, women are just trying to protect their existing rights. Hadley, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you, you I hope you feel you were not censored in any way during that <laughs> conversation. Uh, you, you got it out and, and gave us a window into perhaps uh, what people don't really know about newspapers as well as anything else. Good luck with the new post at the Sunday Times and the book. Perhaps we'll also talk about that. Um, and I mentioned, I read aloud the Guardian statement and I mentioned we've invited the editor of the Guardian, different to the editor of the Observer, onto the programme, Catherine Viner. So I do hope she'll take us up on that. We shall see.